Lewis, who is here um, to give us a, a talk, conversation with Helga Pakasar. Helga will introduce Stan. I just want to say um, my thanks and congratulations to Stan on the last day of his exhibition here. What a privilege it's going to work with him on this show. And uh, how delighted we are that we could close it out with a conversation with him in person. After the conversation is done, we'll have a book signing of his new style book that was just released and which we get our first view of as well today. It's probably going to get hot in here, so we'll try and keep this tight and not too long. Um, clearly, one of the most significant reasons why we need a new building and a new gallery, um, which we are, as many of you know, in the throes of designing and taking through what is about to be an approval process at the City of North Vancouver on Monday. Tomorrow, uh, we introduce first reading of our rezoning, and uh, with that, in two weeks' time on June the 16th, Monday night, there will be a public hearing for the approval of this building. After that, we get to do fundraising to make it a, ha make it a reality, but the public hearing is really the significant event which will give us final approval on a project that has been many, many decades now in the making. So I invite all of you, we'll have all the information, we can't put anything on our website until first reading and referral is called tomorrow night. After tomorrow night, we'll have all the information about the public hearing. I really warmly invite all of you to come out to that. Your support will be critical to our success. And we really want to show our uh, presence at North Van City Hall that evening, sometime after 7 o'clock. All the details will be there. But please mark it in your calendar. Please come out and support. With approval, we get to do talks in a much better building designed by our two architects sitting here in the front row, which we are very hopeful. <laughs> Some of the research overlaps, but 
uh, that must be quite tricky. Um, it wasn't really. I mean, these things were actually happening uh, well, sometimes in a long, long term. Um, the play was sort of in process for five years more or less. Uh, we asked for about three years, and um, it's really a chapter since last um, uh, June. I was last show up in New York City. So it's been in process. Just happened to all come up spontaneously. And I had to find ideas that I could like to. So I haven't had anything all at the beginning of this year, but uh, I survived. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I guess keeping projects on the boil is something you always have to be doing because it seems that you invest many, many years in research and so you're always digesting and linking. And in this case, I'd say that some of the projects are more linked than they might often be, but just pure research for. Yeah, the way home runs for so long, so I got to get into other things. So this is the studio, which we have to talk about here. Um, was kind of based on the fact that I've done a ton of research on that period, the post-war period, and uh, didn't really have the, the, um, the funding to make to realize what I wanted to realize for that. Researching was going to be a, a, a video piece, but we were talking about the Space Center Digital Gallery. Right. Funding just didn't happen, so eventually I realized I could, well, I had the, had the idea of like, if I could do it as a play, I could afford to shoot it myself, because um, then the actors would be rehearsed, and we would put it together, well, why not just make a play? And so the whole concept sort of made sort of uh, general based on that. Right. Why don't I simply make a play? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my problem is that I wrote, if I realize I can imagine how something can be done, I figure I should do it. Uh, forgetting how complex these things may in, in fact end up being. So, yeah, Hello World is yeah. a bit of a, a, a co very complex puzzle because uh, you have to think um, spatially, possibly. Um, we're always, basically, if you come to the play, there is a, um, actors are, are live on stage. Uh, basically producing a film, a feature film, every night um, for four weeks in Vancouver. Um, so they're operating cameras, they're uh, on, a, on a blue screen stage, and they're composited live into virtual sets, which are um, uh, sort of pre pre made so what are called cube maps, which in effect become these sort of spheres around a camera that they can be comp composited inside of. So the camera moves and pans and tilts, um, you sort of see the actor kind of like uh, integrated into that, that, that virtual reality. Um, so basically, the stage is always going to be the stage. We're always looking through that the stage from the proscenium a, a certain way. Um, speaking back a bit, I think. Um, so, um, but I, we always had to rotate the virtual reality around the space of the stage in order to make these actors fit to where we wanted to make them fit. So it's always this very complex spatial puzzle work we're dealing with as we're on planning the piece. Uh, we spent about four weeks in Banff um, rehearsing it two weeks in Vancouver doing rehearsals and, uh, and previews. Um, it's still not quite done. There's still a few uh, tweaks I want to make to the play, but um, yeah, it was a very uh, crazy thing. It's very simple to watch. Well, it's actually very complex to watch because you're watching two things simultaneously. You're always seeing the act live actors on stage at the same time you're seeing the, the film that's being produced uh, simultaneously. Uh, so it's almost like cues, like you're seeing these, these two points of view uh, simultaneously uh, in, in this piece. Yes, it's, it's very complex. Uh technologically as, as well. And that seems very related to, uh, or quite related, let's say, to um, your media works, where you often bring in these different levels of reality or temporality um, that become collaged in that way. And I was wondering how you were thinking about this form, the cinematic stage production, and uh, if you see that as an extension of your artwork. And, would you do another one, or are you thinking along those lines at this point? Kind of like in an inverse way to the work in, in 2003 called Suspiria, mm -hmm. uh, in which there was a live video feed in this sort of monument called Hercules in a place called Castle Germany, and uh, pre recorded elements were uh, sort of projected into the space, and it was all broadcast live down to the exhibition space and on TV uh, simultaneously. Um, so we're seeing a, a live video feed of a space with these sort of uh, uh, fantastic characters projected inside that. Um, in this case, it's the inverse where we have the live actors with a fantastic um, reality around them uh, in space. Which all kind of goes back to my recollection of seeing for, what, what for a long time I thought was an episode of The Avengers, but then re realized later on it was a, a very bad film called 13 Ghosts, made in the 1950s, uh, in which there's this uh, family in Harrison home from a crazy uncle, um, and they Things are kind of weird in this place, and they realize that there are these strange glasses, and they put the glasses on. Suddenly, they realize they're struck by these, these phantoms, these, these sort of uh, awful ghosts that the, the uncle has been collecting, uh, sort of these uh, often murderous uh, spirits. So, the reality is kind of a sort of banal reality, but these glasses on, you realize that there's something else there, um, which then was probably taken up again by 
um, Joe and Carpenter, where they, they live, in which uh, they didn't realize until they passed on, and suddenly there are these aliens walking around people, there's some strange propaganda everywhere in space. So this idea that um, there was kind of this uh, sort of banal reality um, that through a sort of tweak of um, perception you see something else in is kind of an abiding interest in life, which is both uh, played out in Suspiria and, and in Hello Lawrence. Hello Lawrence uh, deals with it in a very specific way, kind of dealing with this idea of the, uh, the film noir. Um, and I had a, sort of a, an epiphany working on a piece about the film noir, which I, I mean, probably, probably obvious to a lot of people, but to me was a, a sudden realization that it has to do with, with the, the trauma of having experienced wartime. So like all the femme fatales, the, the tough guys, the silences, the um, sort of the odd behavior is all based on having seen very awful things around you, having killed people, uh, seeing people die around you, uh, doing sick things you're not proud of to get by during uh, a time away at war or even at home where uh, there's rationing, uh, scarcity, um, uh, and you have to do some things that are, are not really that, that nice. Um, so in a way, the behavior of these people is based on that experience, and the affect of the film is based on the experience of a war, um, which I kind of dramatized in Hello Marks by having um, always this sort of this screen which is between the audience and the actors on stage, which is in a way their fantasy of where they are and the way they think. Uh, but through the screen, you can see the, the actors on stage who are just like sort of like just you know puny people um, who are just, just people together on stage and suddenly projecting uh, where they think they are on that thing, um, on that screen that stage. So it's kind of this, this idea of, um, uh, of, a, of a barrier or a shell or um, a persona you project, project out to the reality is constantly being dramatized in, in Hell Hearts as well. And then those um, puny people are also the cam they're also working the camera, which adds a whole other layer. And it takes a while to discern that. And I think Helen Lawrence um, starts as a puzzle that you start to kind of calculate or <laughs> discern as as it evolves. There's a lot of I mean a lot of people have seen it twice. Uh, I think for that very reason, so you don't quite tell what's going on uh, until you, you've seen it for a while. Uh, and all these details, and all the other actors on the channels, which was an economic thing at first, but in a way, <laughs> it adds another layer to uh, it. Because the, there's a, a main venues are in uh, Toronto and Vancouver. They have different uh, uh, unions, which meant that if we had camera operators in Vancouver, we'd have to have shadow operators from Toronto flown in to watch them work. And vice versa in Toronto. So if we, when we stage in Toronto, we have the Toronto local operators there uh, working on stage, and then the ones in Vancouver, so I have to watch them work. So we had an additional eight technicians that we added to the show we uh, with the uh, camera operators. So it was practical in one way, but also we came from this, this interesting additional level of um, uh, drama performance going on. So it's like the, the theater on stage, so there's kind of a shadow play um, with the actors who are like in silhouette off of the cameras, and then cinema with the, the final screen. So this, um, these uh, challenges that you have with uh, getting into something maybe com more complex than you realize at first, or even uh, working with new technology, it seems like you embrace that in your work, um, like the rendering program <coughs> for your app and for Hogan Sally and everything that has, has gone into these recent projects. I mean, how do you think about um, the challenges of that. I mean, you have this concept, but it has to adapt to the technology as it's evolving as well. And you know, over the course of five years, there's been a lot of change. So I was just wondering um, how you, in your own mind, work that when you have this initial concept and then uh, it's always having to adapt, in a sense, to the imperatives of um, technology itself, or what you're learning as you go along. Um, I've always admired like kind of Stanley Kubrick and the way you actually invent things or, or make the work you want to make, uh, like writing special lenses based on um, satellite photographic lenses uh, to shoot um, like an f.95 lenses that would shoot uh, things in candlelight for for very uh, really interesting. You, you want to make an image in a certain way, um, realizing how that might be achieved, and then develop the tools to, to make that happen. I mean, uh, it happens on smaller scales uh, constantly, like, a, like a, a painter just mixing paints in a certain way is just solving a problem to make the, the thing they want to make. Um, right. Just, you know, it scales it up in a different way. With various collaborators, like the uh, software, well, I guess it, it kind of came from having a, a, an iPhone, realizing there was a, a 
with some rollers in it and compasses, and if I could move that around, um, I thought I could velcro it to a camera that can track the camera's face. Of course, there's like the technical problems, it's like a 10 frame delay, uh, they're very low, low res, mechanical uh, sensors were, were more efficient what we needed. Uh, but uh, yeah, just sort of realizing how something can be made and sort of achieving that uh, technically is what I, you know, we all do as artists, I think. Sure. Uh, but maybe you don't take on quite as much as you do. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the technology to do that did exist five years ago, but it was just fantastically expensive. It actually has some, some limitations as well, like there was a, a big delay between uh, capturing an image and integrating with the, uh, the CG, uh, which has been solved now by the, the bigger companies, but we found a solution to that a couple years ago, or three years ago. It was uh, much, much faster to get that thing happening. Um, because in, in a longer delay, it just looks very strange. Something like the actors on stage moving like five frames later, uh, something happens on screen. Um, so this is a problem we have to solve, uh, which we did. The uh, sensors, I mean, yeah, tripods with sensors that we needed cost like $80,000 each, uh, at least $80,000. Um, so we sort of rebuilt uh, cheaper versions uh, using you know, our, own, our own technology. Do you um, feel you have to understand all of that as you're relying more and more on technicians? I, I know early on in your career you did virtually everything yourself, uh, and I, I think that kind of knowledge, you know, has was really important that you were gathering that to yeah. kind of know things. But now that must be virtually impossible to do. I, I mean, I understand the principle. You, you have to. I mean, um, Kubrick understood the principle of like a. Uh, the speed of the lens in order to realize he needed special lenses to be made uh, for what we achieve, what we achieve. And if you don't know the parameters of your medium, you're just repeating conventions. So uh, if you want to do um, new things with the media, you have to understand, understand, understand what it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you um, uh, tell us a bit about how you made Hogan's Alley, the picture that's in the other room? Uh, in collaboration with uh, some 3D artists. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, we purposed, because basically, for Helen Watch, we built two floors of a, of a hotel, a uh, second hotel in Vancouver, but it was in downtown, torn down in 1948, uh, as well as an entire block, city block, of the Valley, founded by um, uh, Main Street, Gore Street, um, uh, west and east, and then north and south, Union Street and uh, Friar Street. So the entire block we built um, in, to make for, for the, uh, for, for the, for the play um, and for the app as well. Is the sort of virtual sets in the app were referenced and used later on uh, in the play, and so I figured we could just leverage that uh, previous material to uh, to make this image here. Of course, it took a bit more work than I thought it would, as it always does. Um, but uh, yeah, it turned out quite nicely. My my idea of, in doing this is that I wanted to um, build the entire block so I could actually explore the neighborhood like a photographer would, so sort of like sort of sort of look instead of like. The traditional CG where you decide you want this angle, and so you only make exactly elements that are seen from that camera's point of view. I wanted to make the whole thing, so I sort of wander around and see uh, strange combinations of, of images, uh, locations that you wouldn't see otherwise. Um, like, so I could do a virtual location scale. Which I thought was my big idea, but then actually a couple years later, I realized that this was happening in feature films. It's sort of a, a very, uh, what they call a virtual location scale, where they build a rough model, a massive model of, of locations they're going to build in CG. And then the sort of um, director, camera operator, and then the production designer can actually um, negotiate that in various ways by, by looking through it. So anyway, we have this, these assets already, and I want to leverage that to make this, uh, uh, make this picture, which is um, basically a picture composed of little pictures. Um, and when you make doing CG, what you do is you build uh, a wireframe um, or a wireframe mesh, we call a mesh, uh, of an object in, in three dimensions. And you apply on top of that photographic uh, images or textures, uh, which then Give it that photographic look uh, after you light it and then render it out in various ways as you, as you see it. So it is really a collage then. And that's how it appears from a distance. And then as you move into it and start to explore it, it becomes this space that you yeah. find clues for and yeah. Yes, yeah, it's very, very elaborate collage, yeah. Yeah. So this reference to film, that seems to be also a part of uh, the picture insofar as it has that kind of um, establishing shot sort of perspective somewhat. Uh, it maybe appears like a screen that's being lit from inside and uh, it has a very filmic quality to it and I, I think maybe having it black and white it, um, adds to that as well. 
I think it's that hyper real kind of quality from excessive detail that really uh, gives it this kind of uncanny sense of not being quite a photograph, not really being a screen, yeah. obviously. Uh, and it kind of is in that sort of interregnum state of yeah. being something that we don't recognize, even though it's full of historical detail. So is that a dynamic that you like to uh, explore? Between the circle detail and? Well, the idea of things not being quite what they seem, or something that is also using a language from a, from a different, different mediums, so a kind of like a hybrid format, in a sense. I guess when I take traditional photographs, it, it's kind of looking for something that is that kind of uh, contradictory in the image, where there's mm -hmm. things which are not, not quite light, not quite, um, not totally new to local, there's like sort of a, some kind of uh, a tension between chillness or in, in contrast um, in, in the piece. Um, I guess I'm not really answering the question, but uh, maybe try again. <laughs> no, I, I guess. <laughs> um, of course, making a big picture like that has many references, like even perhaps the history painting and how you know what we're looking at. We we bring our expectations to. Uh, I think the making it black and white. Well, why why did you make it black and white? It's more convincing black and white. In color, it's just very difficult to achieve the sort of um, uh, the accuracy. I mean, the you have very extreme color gamuts in, 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 in CG that does not really look that convincing. Uh, so just, it was just a, in a way, practical thing, making it black and white. Also, being in black and white, it looks of the era as well. Right. Not used to seeing, yeah, yeah. seeing that era in, in color either. Right. I mean, there were color photographs back then, but they looked quite artificial and strange to us. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're not used to seeing that uh, era depicted uh, in color. And also film noir. Yeah. That's, that's the connotation there, too. Yeah. So historical accuracy does seem to be you know, something that, uh, of course, you're, you're intensely engaged with just in terms of the amount of research you do to create a, a picture or a film that's coming from or is about a particular period. And how do you access material for that? Like say with Hogan's Alley, where, where do you source your material and what was it? Uh, I guess the main source was the images that we see in that room uh, mm -hmm. around Hogan's Alley. Uh, the city documented um, the neighborhood of the way tore it down in, in the late 1960s uh, to make way for the um, uh, Georgia Viva. Um, so those were an amazing, amazing help. Otherwise, there's uh, fire, fire department records of uh, what was there, the Blackley Stores houses were, who's in the story, uh, who's in the story in the houses, um, the uh, registry of what the citizens were aware, um, hearsay as well, but occasionally there's sort of just uh, a fantasy part over there. Um, you know, I was, I've heard that uh, there's a beer garden in, in the alley, um, where by the name of Buddy White, some guy named E. White lived in the, in the, or owned the house that was, uh, or in terms of beer garden. I'm not sure if it would be there or not, but uh, that's what I did. I did meet a guy named uh, uh, Emilio Girona, who was actually had a paper route in, in the area when he was a kid, and then he actually knew some of these people. So, he, so you do interviews and yeah. um, find people? And he makes stuff up too. I mean, when you're doing CG, like, I mean, you didn't photograph, you just have things and put things there and you photograph them, and they're, and they're, they're accurate, they look convincing. But if you're doing CG, you have to film everything. If there's garbage, you have to like, decide what kind of garbage is going to be. If there's dirt, if there's foliage, you decide what's going to be, and you have to make it. Um, it's just a complex thing about working in that CG reality. There's, you can't just sort of um, find things and put them together. You actually have to just make everything and decide what it's going to be. And changing Buddy White's name to Buddy Black. Yeah. Um, that was <laughs> so that fun. was like playing with fact in my yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know Buddy White. I don't know if he's happened to have any heirs. I don't know if they'd be pissed off about him being figured as a... Uh, um, uh, a sort of gambling guy who ran around prostitutes and uh, did a, had a speakeasy as well. I mean, this is kind of the stories we hear about him, but I don't know if that's really who he was or what he was. And um, 
Thor gets through that. <laughs> <laughs> so this idea of historical accuracy is, uh, I think it's interesting how you on the one hand are very in, you know, intensely committed to to recreating, you know, a popcorn box, or you know, you go to get great trouble to render something from the past, and uh, at the same time, uh, inaccuracy or historical um, slippage of the truth is something that you also bring into your work. It's it's like your uh, like it's a problematic concept, historical accuracy itself. And uh, so... I guess it works in the idea of condensation, condensing uh, certain things into, into one picture. Uh, things which, I mean, you can find pictures which have certain aspects you're, I, I'm interested in, in sort of uh, seeing it from there. But then putting the two things together in one image is what, what's going to keep for me. Uh, that, that so it becomes something else. That's what you can do by the, the sort of this uh, process of recreation, is to uh, synthesize these different aspects into one, one image which contains more than one, one idea. So, uh, in terms of seeking out um, places that haven't really been depicted before with great detail. I would say like your, your Woodward's um, Abbott Cordova mural does that as well. Uh, so it becomes like something that um, has a place in our history. Do you see that as, as a, like a public, um, not a service exactly, but do you see yourself as a bit like a social historian you're, you're making a picture of, of what was previously fragments, which definitely I would say in the case of Hogan's Alley, they were just snippets of this, that, around, and finally we have a picture of this legendary place. Sure. <laughs> so, so as part of that, do you, um, have you thought of going back to, to sites like the, uh, say, the, um, the uh, 100 West Hastings panorama that was um, an incredible document at a you know very significant time of that particular place, but now of course it's completely gentrified. Would you ever consider going back and, and like revisiting? Yeah, I'd never say never. But I mean, I was more interested in the idea of that place going fallow. Like often they, people do it in cities, or capital does it in cities, where they allow a certain area to be you know like like a like, like fields go go fallow for a while until they can be exploited later on. And you can see in that photograph how certain areas were not useful to capital, so they're not being exploited. Whereas at, the, at one end, you see that the sort of process of gentrification beginning, uh, which is sort of happens later on. So it's, it's in motion there. And then that tension is present in the photograph, which I found more interesting than having you know, a completely gentrified image of that block, which uh, is more you know, vocal than that, that tension I'm talking about. Right. But I, I mean, it, it is important to, to remember um, you know what the conditions of a, of a place were, and um, you know, so how did we how did we live then? I mean, even, even it's only 50 years, 60 years from, uh, around the to the post-war period from, from now, but still that reality is very different from what we know now. It's like when you know entertainment was or culture is something you did instead of something you bought, and that things would be repaired rather than uh, like thrown away and, and, and read and, and repurchased. I mean, this, this that culture is very very different from what we what we know now. And so it's always a process of doing research to a point where I can be intuitive about something, to know what the conditions were, so I can just uh, make an intuitive choice as to what's, what it looks right, what feels right um, in a certain era. Like I originally wanted to shoot the Cordova, Abbott and Cordova image at Abbott Cordova, um, but they have modified the streets to look old timey with these sort of paving uh, stones, which it did not look like in the 19th century. So in order to be accurate, I had to, well, actually there was a, one shop owner wanted us to charge us fifty thousand uh, dollars to dress her the windows to make it look sort of slightly accurate, and I thought we could just build it for that. It took and twice, we did. We did. <laughs> uh, it cost twice as much for that, but um, it was more, a lot more flexible having been able to make things from scratch to look exactly like they should have, as opposed to having small windows while working on the location. Well, like this going Goa, which I shot in California, um, I met these guys who were were the I've written the only uh, guidebook to Angola, and I, I told me that um, there were, uh, I think, I think 30,000 landmines uh, planted during the Civil War, which lasted 28 years. Um, so if you get sort of stray from the uh, uh, sort of the beaten path, you're very, you're, you risk uh, getting blown up. Because they only take out like 1,500 a year, so it's still a very long process of remediation. It's kind of the most expensive city in the world right now, Luanda-ish is, so, um, 
who work there is really uh, they built sort of a bizarre sort of petro uh, economy going on. There's huge oil reserves uh, in the north uh, uh, northwest of Angola, um, and a lot of the buildings were there. The settings were are gone now, so um, uh, I might as well just rebuild it in California as opposed to um, going to uh, uh, Angola itself and issue the visa. So that process again of like almost like a movie maker, you, you build sets, is um, uh, something that now that you're also being able to do a digital uh, version of things, is that supplanting um, perhaps the, the desire to make sets? Building sets is way faster. Is it? <laughs> it's way faster. Oh. Yeah. Maybe easier. Yeah. Way yeah. So the Woodward's uh, mural is really a combination of both, isn't it? Also digital, digitally worked. Yeah, I guess it was only one story high the set, and so we, um, everything about that was an extension uh, that was kind of like constructed. Yeah. So how do you feel about that piece, or think about it now? It's public life there in the courtyard, often a basketball court. Has, has that... Um... I'm not super happy about that, but... Uh... <laughs> But I guess it's the only that's of course without any science, so, so why not? Yeah. But I mean, I, I still see people standing and looking at that for like 90 seconds, which in an art gallery you should really see. You really should really see that. And um, actually, when we're shooting um, this century studio, we were at a we had to get a ranger because uh, we're shooting sort of outside and by by park, and she realized who I was later on, and, and I thought she was going to bust me for smoking. On, on Parkland, and she said, "No, I just want to tell you that I, um, I love your work. No, I, I love that Evan uh, Crowley image because it's unlike pop cars. It's not something you like or dislike. It's something you want to talk about. And that was the best pop I had ever. That piece is like something you want to talk about. It's something you just you uh, are, are different to or have a sort of a um, you know." Yeah, I, I think it. I I often see people hanging around there and looking up, and, yeah. and I imagine the basketball players like they. They have a way of talking about it too, because it's very, very much there. So, um, so as public life is evolving, surely as well. Yeah, and the other was just to have something that would be um, rather just like something uh, purely decorative, or something would be uh, honoring some great moment in history. Look at something with the problems. And my, my thesis was that um, this event changed the character of the neighborhood for for a long period of time. It's just changing now because of uh, gentrification in the neighborhood. Um, but it, it also changed the policy of police to the, the relative to the citizens. And they can't do that anymore. They can't uh, sort of create riots anymore as, as they did in that period. So there's an inquest and they, they changed the policy. And of course, it's kind of ironic that this, this is a place that is not, not really a public space, controlled by private security guards who uh, have no accountability uh, with, with regard to the people that they're, they're policing. So as a documentarian, then, you you're not really thinking of these projects as um, studies or something that's ongoing, but you find that moment that you uh, create or reconstitute in some way, yeah. and then you find other moments. Yeah, it's like an event. It's like a philosophical interview event where something traumatic happens, something that's like un un unexplicable, um, sort of unfamiliar, and you either deal with that by um, return, like, like sort of restoring a, a status quo as much force as possible, or trying to find a new solution for this new situation. Uh, so the, the event is a traumatic moment that uh, I'm often preoccupied with in my work. That moment of, um, I think you've called it a kind of liminal space, um, which is, I think, uh, how you've also discussed uh, your attraction to post-war Vancouver. So is that um, a time, was that partly uh, an attraction to you because it was perhaps um, in a bit of chaos, or things were in transition, or transformation. Exactly, we know what the war is like, we have an idea what World War II is like, uh, both home and abroad, we have an idea what the 50s is like, even though it's mostly ideological, but the space in between, how do we get from the sort of state of exceptions in the war where black markets are okay, uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of gambling is okay, and et cetera, et cetera, to the, the 1950s where it's all about a very strict kind of propriety. Like how do you get from one to the other in that five year period is what um, these projects looked at. Uh, Helen Lawrence, uh, the app, um, the Century Studio. And maybe the 70s uh, is a bit like that as well. Yeah, I mean, basically it was. You're drawn to that. 
that condition of instability. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Which was very creative and productive as well. And in the 70s, like there's so many genres of pop music that were created during that, that decade that we um, still live today. I mean, imagine what happened there, like um, you know, reggae music, dub music, heavy metal music, uh, punk rock music, disco music, all, all that happened in the 1970s. And what genres we have since then? Um, all all these revivals, like grunge, which is sort of a, a punk rock revival, uh, you know, various kinds of uh, dance music, which are uh, revivals of disco, basically. Um, but it was a very, very creative time, despite the fact it was a very, very economically uh, politically unstable time as well, where they didn't quite find well, a way. And because of, perhaps. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, looking at these particular times and places and um, uh, Vancouver has certainly been an ongoing interest of yours. I mean, not only is it a place that you live in and observe uh, intensely, um, it's also you found it a rich ground for, for um, thinking about perhaps larger conditions. Or how do, you, how do you think of Vancouver? Is it just a site that's immediate for you and one that you bring a lot to in terms of understanding? Or does it seem typical of something more generic? Well, yeah, you can have local symptoms of a global condition. I mean, that's what I look for in Vancouver. I mean, this, this post-war condition of, um, say, the urban reconstruction, which is more um, to make to the app, which kind of deals with this idea of social reconstruction in the period, thematically, than what has kind of been the background in Helen Morris and uh, Mr. Studio. These are things which were uh, across the continent. The world was being reconstructed after World War II, but uh, this reorganization of urban space was quite peculiar to, to North America, where you would, um, Suburbanize the middle class, warehouse the poor, and raise the uh, ethnic ghettos in, in the inner cities. This happened in almost virtually every big city in, in North America. It happened on a very minor scale, or a smaller scale than Vancouver, but it still happened in the West. So I, I try to work like I try to work over the way. I try to alternate the things here and things elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Although um, the sort of mid uh, mid century thing sort of kept me uh, here, got away from Vancouver for quite some time. So, uh, in light of this idea that your um, your work is you're looking at the past, but um, from the point from the very much decidedly from the present, does Vancouver and these works that have come out of your recent um, projects are they uh, is that a, in a way a critique of Vancouver today, or what is its relationship to this social landscape now? We have a of fun, my bet. Crazy. It's crazier. Yeah. Um, that's which uh, more fun than that. Was. But um, you know, historical works like science fiction works are often allegories of the present in some way or other. And so these are it's often a preparation of things that are, that are happening now. Um, you know, there's a housing in the post-war period. There's a housing crisis. Uh, they had to rebuild the, uh, the world economy because there's a the bank system in shambles. Um, there was a sort of a, a specter, spectral threat of, uh, of uh, the Cold War back then, terrorism now. So the parallels between, between the two. I mean, basically, I, my feeling was when I began researching these works was that um, with George Bush out of power would be the end as they were on terror. So we entered a post war period. So I wanted to sort of compare that post war period uh, to the end. Um, didn't quite get the out of the connections I wanted to was hoping to go there. Still with the, it has an yeah. 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 I mean, for me, one of the most compelling aspects of your work is that you do put um, us into these other places, uh, often in another time. And, uh, and so you're there, but you never get completely lost because there is always this sense of looking at somehow you have these reminders of where we are right now. And part of that, I think, is through the, the way you use you know, the camera apparatus as um, a kind of visioning system. Um, but at the same time, you, you uh, allow for this seduction of being, being somewhere else and putting yourself into that space. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, like through music, perhaps that's how Rwanda Kinshasa operates, is that it's, it's a kind of hypnotic, um, yeah. being somewhere else. And it seems very, I mean, it seems very spontaneous, very immediate, but actually it's a huge construction. Because uh, like, we only shot five musicians on one day, and another five musicians on another day, so they never actually played together. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of that, that work is basically um, arranged with the montage happening spontaneously, which was a real puzzle because, I mean, 
I couldn't edit until it was arranged, but we couldn't arrange until it was edited. Uh, as you, you as the person you've seen on the screen, we have to hear what they're doing. So that all has to make sense musically as well as uh, uh, pictorially as well. So it was a uh, bit of a puzzle, but really kind of the joy I work on too. So how do you think, like you have these um, tools like you know sound uh, scripts and uh, a theatrical stage or the immersive space of an app and, and a lot of um, a lot of your fingertips there. How do you feel about then <coughs> coming back to still photography? Does that seem um, like inert in some ways or a, a different kind of challenge? I'm trying to think of something to do again with still photography because I really I enjoy doing it and I actually when I made this century basically for, for five years I've been focusing almost exclusively on photography, still photography as um, Helen Walsh is put her in the background. Um, so just to sort of get that taken seriously because people say, well, you know, your photographs are okay, but the installations are where it's at. You know, they, they, <laughs> they call my photographs location photographs for the uh, uh, installations, even though I haven't done that uh, since 1991. Uh, people still think of it that way. So I wanted to, to have my photographs taken seriously, and that's why I did work on that exclusively for, for five years. Um, but I really, I mean, I got to understand the apparatus and the process of working with uh, uh, photographs and flash in particular. I'd love to find a way to get back to that, but I haven't quite got the, got the idea yet. So the mid-century studio works that are in the other rooms, um, they're very much about that, I think, also, that you seem to, um, it's, it's kind of like uh, you become involved in, let's say, the, like the magic of making photographs with special effects. And uh, I wondered, I wondered about you taking on this persona. You've talked about that, uh, that as this kind of, you're the, the posing as this fictionalized um, post-war photojournalist. And so you're kind of setting up a story within a story. Yeah, I mean, sort of what happens in, in gaps, like, uh, <clears throat> I mean, people often say cinema is like a bunch of photographs in succession, but it's not really true at all. Uh, cinema is the impression of motion between the frames. Uh, like the, the idea that from this frame to that frame, something has, has, has taken place, something has transpired temporally. That's, that's what the cinema is about, or film is about. Cinema is also about montage. Like you cut from one shot to another shot. Um, there's that negative space of the cut, which is in which we have a fantasy of what it means from one shot to the other. Are we tra tra reversing time and space? Are we changing point of view from a, subjectively from one person to another? That cut is where that, that thing happens. It's really a negative space in which something happens. So I wanted to try that in this century by having uh, sort of the gaps between the photographs, which if you see them in the book is kind of linear, you realize between these photographs, time is taking place, and what has this, this person done uh, in the period? How has this photograph, the photograph practice changed in that period? And that's sort of reducing the gaps between the images as part of the, um, the storytelling process of the work. Mm. Where we see his craft go from being kind of sloppy at the beginning, uh, where he tries to make things happen and kind of fails, like uh, trying to illuminate the guy in camouflage to make it more visible, but uh, the effect being is more invisible because of the delay um, to photographs at the end, which are um, better pictures uh, but less documentary, where they are, uh, he actually has to stage these things to get the images that he needs to, to get. Uh, like the guys playing dice, you can never get that shot because you have your agreement to, to do that. If you're a big clumsy apparatus, you're probably getting a couple of shots, you have to you know, get right in there for that happens, they know you're there, so there's no immediacy. Which I realized as I was looking at. Um, uh, the Black Star Collection in Toronto, I went through 6,000 images in two days to sort of test my thesis that um, there was a less requirement of pictorial quality uh, in 1945 and uh, than there was in 1950. And that process kind of actually played out there where oh, that's uh, interesting. later on, mm -hmm. by 1950, you do have like the sort of the standard lifestyle uh, still photographs, but they're clearly all staged where uh, or I will say like, we'll tell people where to stand, you know, uh, after, like uh, flashes that are sort of in different places, like off the camera, so they're definitely not uh, spontaneous documented images. They're not real stage photographs. Well, maybe another aspect of that is just the images as, as single pictures too. That, that they seem they they um, are suggesting that they're it's artificial, that they're fake, that you've made them, you've staged them as you did. But at the same time, they're uh, they look very much like true news photographs. And in fact, many of our visitors have been mixed up by that. So yes. that's another way that you're working with that gap, I would say. Yeah, it was actually difficult to find things which are old, 
but not too old, because we had, had things there that were, they couldn't all be from 1945, they had to be like from about the 1930s to look the, but they had a kind of wear that would have 1945. <coughs> so finding that right balance of, uh, of wear was quite, quite difficult uh, in Vancouver, because they're always, they're always tearing buildings down all the time. Um, so it's a combination of actually finding places or adding details that are, are peculiar to the area. Uh, there's like one mansion in um, Shaughnessy called Rosemary used for a lot of occasions because it had a, a, a great basement, a great attic, and just the way it was constructed uh, it was from the 20s, but it was in great shape, so it looked like it was uh, uh, in the 40s as well. So we used that for various kinds of spaces. Um, a few places downtown we found. Uh, the hardest one was to sort of get in the bathroom. We were actually playing playing dice. We actually had to rent an entire building to get that one staircase. <laughs> <laughs> But um, mm. it's kind of worth it. It, it, was, it would cost the same to build the set, so we just bring the building instead. Mm. So you're honing your skills um, as a, as a like, let's say, a straight photographer, documentarian, and then at the same time uh, through these staging techniques. So how do you think of your skills differently as a photographer, or do you, like, in terms of what it takes to stage the photograph? and construct it and what it takes to look at the world and Well, it came from a lot of experience making uh, moving pictures with a film crew, and so that's why I could do so many images in such a short period of time. We planned the week, because basically the bulk of the Century Studios was shot in one week, uh, and actually wow. we, came, we came to under, under budget, so we had a, a few more things we could do later on. Uh, basically, you know, you could do, uh, typically you do like five or six minutes a day of, with the film crew, so instead of doing the, the, the scenes, we'd do shots. So I'd have to get like, you know, uh, four shots a day, uh, or four, four or five shots a day, and this is, is what we did. Uh, and Bob Faulkner improvised, I did all the magic stuff, I just hired two musicians uh, and asked them what their repertoire was, because I looked at it and tried to find out how I could shoot that. Um, mostly, I was not looking at uh, an image I wanted to make, but a situation, trying to make a situation happen and then photographing it. Uh, I was kind of immediately like, I like, so these photographs, you, you, um, you've referred to your works as um, uh, articulating a kind of psychogeographic space. Uh, <laughs> somewhere, yes. Or I wondered if the mid-century studio functioned like that for you as well. Like they are, it's a more of a displaced, I mean, you're, you're, um, it's like you're making your own film in a sense, but do you think of that type of photography as also being of, of a period and thus reflective of a, a kind of psychogeography. Yeah, and what would be acceptable as an image at uh, that point? Right, that's what I mean. Yeah. How, how strange that is. Or what is news. Yeah. And also, but the, the fundamental strangeness of photography, which is a very you know, weird thing. It's like a totally alien, inhuman way of seeing the world. We don't see like photographs. Or we, we may think we do, but we don't really. Um, just like we think we dream like movies, but we, we don't really. We just, it, it, it's the easiest way to talk about it. I mean, we see in fragments, but only this much of our vision is really sharp, or it's still kind of blurry. And what we see is based on uh, pattern recognition, memory, and sort of reconstructing their mind what, what really is there. But we don't see like a whole crystal like in a photograph. It's totally an inhuman way of right. seeing the world. Right. And like the apparatus is this thing outside of our bodies, which is an uh, inhuman intelligence. It's like, a, I mean, an optical apparatus that does this thing, but it's not a human way of uh, seeing the world. So there's always a tension between what we see and how we how we think we see, and the, the, the weird things this camera does uh, on, on its own device. Just kind of what these things are. Is about. It, these that's things, just what I was going to say. These yeah. images are kind of like when you take a photograph, um, like a photomechanically, um, or uh, in an analog way. You know, when the light exposes the film, there is this sort of mysterious process going on. So this sort of percolates inside the uh, the, the emulsion before it's processed and fixed, etc. Um, in, in in visual photography. It's about encoding. The light goes into the uh, a darkened manifold, um, uh, it excites a photoelectric process, and then it gets, in, it gets encoded, gets written into a, another form. So in a way, these images are like failed photographs, but they're in a way a depiction of what happens inside that black box, uh, the thing which is happening is inside the, the apparatus, um, but before we actually see it come out of it, uh, or make an image. And they're lensless, so that becomes a very... Uh, these are, these are we're done uh, rational lenses. Well, computer lens. Uh, there's a relation between the, uh, I mean, the photoelectrical process of uh, exposure happening oh, okay. and, and the encoding. Just it's like the failed, failed encoding that happens here. Which I was uh, collecting failures as I was shooting, doing shoots in uh, mid-century and um, disco Angola, and then I realized later on how to do it myself to sort of recreate these, uh, these, these images. 
But strangely, the best ones are the ones that happen during spontaneously. And how do you determine best then? Uh, the less, um, uh, more unusual ones. Hmm. So, are, so the source material is not significant for you, or is it? But they're your, like, that they're from Disco Angola, or? They're dated that way, and they're sort of indicate where they came mm -hmm. from, uh, to a certain degree. Um, but really, it's about the, the apparatus. Like, it's, we're, we're seeing what the apparatus is doing. So while we might want to use the word abstract to define them, they're actually very concrete documents. Yeah, the material, then, material is photographs, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that like an, uh, would you maybe say that might be a new type of realism, that these images are? Um, well, it's, it's a concrete thing. I mean, realism it's is concrete, a, yes. Realism is a style, it's an idea that um, uh, we can somehow, uh, things look un uninflected by uh, intention uh, to, to a certain degree. Um, so these aren't realist in, in, in that sense at all, but these are definitely They're con representations. A con concrete index of what the, the visual apparatus is doing. So are you uh, thinking about new media theory and uh, other um, <coughs> artists working in this, in this kind of manner, or how, do you, how are you um, thinking about this work? <laughs> I'm kind of context. I mean, there's a now like the old JPEG, um, late way JPEGs work. There's a thing called the discrete cosine transform of JPEG images. I'm trying to see if I can find a photograph, write an image. Because basically it's all, it's all code. I'm trying to see if I can, trying to figure a way if I can actually write um, a photograph. Hmm. So it seems like a lot of uh, contemporary photographers working with abstraction are still tied to like the rhetoric of, rhetoric of expression or painting and... Mexicality. Yes, yeah. yeah. So even though um, this work might not look like a typical stand-up list, it actually seems very linked to how you think. They're totally a stand-up list. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, you're, you're interested in, in the apparatus and, um, and just how you think about information, and again, that, that uh, how you explore accuracy itself. So, um, so in a bigger way, like you've always been very interested in, uh, or highly attentive to our mediated world and what, what that is in terms of its social impact, uh, like say with the early broadcast television pieces and uh, your films, so how are you thinking about the uh, impact of media today? I mean, it's so completely different and also so much more complex. Um, I guess it's that tension between you know what's human and what's inhuman, because we kind of get our, get our information from these uh, inhuman means uh, by media. So we're seeing things, and when we're, we imagine that we think that way, we imagine that we see that way, we really don't. Um, so I'm interested in exploring the tension between the two. As well as, um, yeah, how are we doing for time? I'm just being... Oh dear. Um, well, maybe we should open it to the floor. Uh, and I don't really... Let's just um, leave it at that for now. Already. Okay. <laughs>